Oh, yeah. Red states and blue states have now entered the cultural lexicon. We all know what those are. But red brains and blue brains are a little more mysterious. Um, but science insists that they exist. In personality testing, the brains are different. In brain function, there are differences. In brain structure, there are differences. And like many elements of personality, this one is about 50% genetic, which says that these differences evolved for a reason. They have a purpose. What could be this purpose? <laughs> and uh, what I'm proposing is that these differences are rooted in our deep history as a territorial animal. Oh, most animals are territorial. Um, the whole point of life is to reproduce as frequently as possible. And you can do that most efficiently if you have a steady supply of certain limited resources. So a clever animal will monopolize a territory that contains life's essentials. You have to have water. You have to have food. And as a shorthand for reproductive opportunities, you got to have some uteruses. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is how we evolved. We're a social animal, and so traditionally we teamed up in gangs of 100 to 200 souls to defend a territory that was surrounded by other gangs defending other territories. This is who we are in here. But even the greatest territory on Earth has some shortcomings. So consider obsidian, which is the gold standard for stone tools, right? It fractures down to a, a, an edge a molecule wide and delivers killer haircuts. <laughs> but it occurs in very few human ter territories. Likewise, the stuff that you've already accumulated is vulnerable to degradation just because of the chaotic nature of nature. So your water can dry up, your food can run away, and nine out of ten mammals agree that there's no such thing as too many uteruses. <laughs> so, these, sh these shortcomings uh, in your territory present the need to reach out toward the other territories to access the stuff that you need. But how permeable do you want your boundary to be? Because the second you open the gate, you're looking at strangers who want your stuff. Right outside the gate, there are food stealers. There are uterus stealers. <laughs> there are sick people who have the capacity to wipe out your entire tribe in an afternoon. So how do you protect what you have accumulated <laughs> without <laughs> and still maintain access to the stuff you might need later? And what I'm proposing is uh, that diversity is the safest policy. Um, so scientists, they, they split up the really, really red brains and the true, true blue brains, and they do experiments to see what, what's going on here. Um, and what we're finding in the red brain is the makings of a crack defense force. This is a brain that presumes the worst about a stranger at the gate <laughs> and is prepared to act really quickly to reduce the threat. So let's look at some experiments. In uh, this experiment, scientists create blurry, ambiguous expressions, and they ask people to tell us what emotion you perceive here. And reliably, a red brain perceives emotions that are more threatening and more dominant than a blue brain sees. So it's erring on the side of safety. In this experiment, people's eye muscles are wired in response to a sudden burst of noise. And the blink reflex snaps the eyes shut to protect them from bad events, which tend to come suddenly and loudly. And the red brain snaps the eyes shut with three times the force of a blue brain. They're hardwired for, for hard times. Not every threat arrives suddenly and loudly. <laughs> uh, we've evolved an emotion called disgust, which actually alerts us to sources of contagion. So vomity, snotty, drooly things make us feel this emotion. And Reliably, the red brain has a stronger disgust response than the blue brain. When you present a collage of images like this, the red brain orients to the threatening images faster, studies them longer, and actually has a stronger adrenaline response when looking at those images. Under the hood, the red brain has a larger right amygdala. The amygdala is a brain region that, that monitors the world for excitement, both positive and negative. 
in the red brain, this larger amygdala correlates with a willingness and interest in stepping forward to confront a threat. So given all the threats that this brain perceives in the world, how does it respond? And it seems to want hard and fast rules that will allow it to act swiftly. So, I mean, it makes sense for this brain type to want a swift response because emergencies tend to arrive suddenly and call for a sudden response. Dithering and pondering and debating are not ideal emergency responses. So when you ask this brain the standard question, society works best when? They want authoritarian structures with clear hierarchies, clear chains of command. These produce high predictability. In personality testing, the red brain has an edge in conscientiousness, and that measures things like loyalty, honesty, and self-discipline. So what we've got is a brain that is primed to notice when a threat arrives, and positioned to react quickly to secure the territory. But how impermeable do you want your boundaries to be? The risk is inbreeding and stagnation, if they're perfect. <laughs> so introducing the blue brain. And here we have a trade delegate. This is, the blue brain is Marco Polo, who wakes up on a beautiful morning in Italy and thinks, this would be an awesome day to walk to China. <laughs> I, won't, I won't understand the language, I won't recognize the food, and it'll be great. So, when the blue brain sees this picture, it does orient first to the threatening images, but then it hops on to the bunnies and the flowers, the opportunities, can I eat that? and it actually has a stronger adrenaline response to the bunnies and the flowers. <laughs> in this experiment, people are told about a young man who robs and stabs an old lady. And the blue brain is happy to assess the typical jail time to this criminal until you start filling in some context. So the kid had a brain tumor. Oh, that's so sad. Um, the kid was being evicted and he needed the money. Oh, that's terrible. So this brain does not see a black and white world. It sees a thousand shades of gray and is interested in them. Uh, in this experiment, colored beans fly at you on a computer screen, and you don't know until you click them if they're going to give you money or take money. And the blue brain experiments with more colors of beans than a red brain. It loses more money in the name of exploration. And under... <laughs> Are you relating? <laughs> um, under this hood, uh, there's a little more real estate dedicated to an area that's implicated in changing your mind. We all run a background program that compares our beliefs, our rules, to what we observe in the world. And when things get too far out of whack, we update our rules. And the blue brain may try to keep its rule book a little more up to date. Um, so when you ask this brain, given all the opportunities you see in the world, what are you, what are you going to do about it? They're going to explore every one of them. This brain wants the opportunity, like, when in Rome, give me the chance to do as the Romans do. They want flexibility. When you ask them how society works best, they want flat systems, egalitarian systems with high individual autonomy. In personality testing, the blue brain has an edge in openness to experience. And that describes a true cognitive hunger, an appetite for information, a real interest in new ideas. And that is really convenient when your host sits you down to a meal of fermented shark. <laughs> That's the brain you want. Um, and so what we have in the blue brain is a personality that sees the stranger as, at the gate as an opportunity and is prepared to overlook their foreign creepiness. Um, so you can see how the two are complementary at the small scale. One type is focused on the safety of what's been accumulated, and the other is maintaining connections in case something should go wrong. Does this dichotomy scale up to the modern context? Many of the territorial issues are easily recognizable today. Uh, our favorite tool is no longer obsidian, but there are plenty of things we want from outside. 
uh, we, we seem to be eternally on a quest for clean water and always with the uteruses. <laughs> and um, many of the threats are only thinly disguised. We call the food stealers job stealers now. The uterus stealers come in a whole range of colors. And uh, <laughs> the, the germs, they just don't quit. But there are strange new pressures bearing down on our ancient little territorial brains. For one thing, the whole concept of territory won't stay put. One minute we consider the territory, the households, our family, and the next minute it explodes to incorporate the entire Western world. Uh, on the neighborhood scale, we all know somebody of the complementary brain type, and when we see that person at the soccer game, we don't run up and shout abuse in their face. Uh, why not? As a member of the local tribe, they are trustworthy. We can easily believe that that person means us no harm. But a complementary brain type sitting 3,000 miles away and tearing up Facebook with her political observations, we lack the infrastructure to trust that person. And now these millions of us are gonna to try to argue about social policy using political terms that have no bearing on the way our brains have wrestled with territorial threats and opportunities for millions of years. For instance, uh, immigration. You're for it, you're against it. In fact, that stranger at the gate can present wildly different territorial issues. So this stranger at the gate wants to serve in our military. Come on in. This stranger has Ebola. Stab him. This stranger is picking our broccoli. That's cool, come on in. You can see how the language we try to use to discuss social issues has been divorced from the way our brains have dealt with these issues since forever. So given this bizarre new global territory we're trying to navigate, can we still appreciate each other? And I think we should. For one thing, uh, like science, the media also focus on the very extreme ends of the spectrum where the differences are easier to identify. And the truth is that many of us are in the middle. Secondly, one of the first genes to be implicated in political behavior actually occurs at both of those extremes. It's a dopamine gene variant, and what it may do is cause us to feel good about social participation, about working together toward a shared goal. The fact, again, that nature has distributed this at both ends of the spectrum argues that both roles are mandatory. And it stands to reason a territory run entirely by protectors will stagnate and starve and be deprived of the iPhone. <laughs> And a territory run entirely by connectors will be robbed blind by every passing stealer. <laughs> and paralyzed by meetings run on the consensus model. <laughs> so this, uh, what I'm presenting is, is a hypothesis for how this difference arose, and obviously there's no way to prove it, there's no way to disprove it, but you are free to test drive it and see how it feels and see if it helps you to make sense of the world. Thank you.